Joining us now to take a look at what's driving commodity prices and what we can expect for the rest of the year from our London studio, we've got Ted George, Soft Commodities Specialist at EcoBank. Ted, thanks so much for joining us right now. So just looking at the price uh, price movements that we have seen on the month, the cocoa up by 3.8%, uh, you know, coffee bean prices up around 4%. We've got cotton up 2.5%, but of course, maize and wheat prices, that's really where we're seeing a rally across the board. Overall, though, can you give us a macro view on what's driving soft commodities right now? Yeah. Well, a lot of it has been about demand, um, but it really depends on the soft commodity that you're talking about. If we take the question of corn or um, wheat um, uh, or, or soya, um, it's really the, the, the drought in the U.S. Um, it's really led to a catastrophic drop in yields. There's real concern in markets that will there be enough corn for the international markets, and that's why you're seeing such high prices. But for coffee or cocoa, it's a different story. Uh, coffee, there has been unbelievable demand for robusta beans, ironically because they were much cheaper than Arabica, but of course they've gone up a lot in price over the last year because of the demand for them. Whereas cocoa, we've seen a recent strength in cocoa prices because of concerns about Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Uh, particularly in Cote d'Ivoire, there re there's reform of the sector. It's not complete. And of course, the new season starts on the 1st of October. So there's worries there might not be enough uh, cocoa for the global markets. That's why you're seeing a lot of buying activity. Um, let, but I think the real about, concern, um, certainly when it comes to Africa, um, is this question of maize and cause prices. Ted, let's talk about the cocoa market for a second, if you might. Um, yeah. Just interesting, you know, in terms of that, the reforms taking place in the cocoa industry, the government has introduced the stabilization fund and looking, uh, looking for it to contain up to $55 million. Just talk to us around the implementation of this and when we're going to see the impacts, the full impact paths of these reforms uh, in terms of exports and perhaps on prices. Well, I mean, that's the really big question about the stabilization fund. Many other African countries have tried to set up stabilization funds. And the idea is that at the beginning of the season, the regulator sets a standard price, which in Cote d'Ivoire's case would be at least 70% of the international price of cocoa. And that guarantees farmers will get this. But of course, when you're buying during the season, there is uh, forward auctions uh, in a special auction, and you might buy above or below that price. And the stabilization fund is to basically pay the difference. But of course, you get into big trouble if uh, a country decides to set a very high price for cocoa to please the farmers and then finds that international prices drop they owe a lot of money then to the different buyers and so the real question is how this fund will be used and actually we haven't seen the details yet um, but I think certainly overall for Cote d'Ivoire it's absolutely the right direction that they're taking for reform of the sector but the, perhaps the biggest question is how will the auction work if you have the big companies such as Olam or Glencore or um, Cargill ADM they source their own cocoa up country. They're going to have to take that through the um, auction house and if you like bid on their own cocoa. How will that work? It's still not clear. Yeah, still not clear but in the meantime we are looking at a slight deficit for 2012-2013. Uh, for uh, your view on the price right now, it was up by 3.8% on the month sitting at $2,376 right now or just above that. Exactly. Well, I think we're going to see the price. It could, it could come down. I mean, so much depends on what happens with the European grind. One of the reasons the price shot up so strongly a few months ago is the grind data for Europe, which is the largest off-taker of cocoa, dropped really sharply. But of course, that means they've been using up stocks. So with the new season starting, we should expect a lot more buying activity from the biggest buying region. Then you have these doubts over will Cote d'Ivoire season start well. And Cote d'Ivoire is, of course, the largest producer. Next door, Ghana as well, isn't predicting such a great season next year. And and of course, if you factor in things like will El Nino have an impact, that typically reduces uh, cocoa output by about 2% globally. So all these factors you would expect would actually buoy prices going forward. But if it turns out the seasons start well, we could see a bit of a falling off in prices later in the year. The, the cotton market is an interesting one, especially what's taking place in Burkina Faso, because that, of course, is a big producer of cotton. Uh, it seems that gen genetically modified um, crops haven't been as successful as expected. Um, what is the tactic now of the government with regards to using GM cotton? And, and how much of an impact does this have on, on the overall market? 
Well, it's very significant in the terms of West Africa. Burkina Faso is by far the largest producer of cotton, along with Mali. Uh, and even though Mali has current problems, it's also producing at a very high level. But on a global scale, it's very small, the production coming out of Africa, perhaps less than 3% of global stocks. And that means that basically the sector is very much um, subject to the decisions of the Chinese and the Americans, what they want to do with the international cotton market. One of the efforts of, Guinea, uh, of, of Burkina Faso was to try and increase the amount of cotton. And this is why they went for GM cotton. But it appears that the main problem is something which has affected the entire sector for many years, which is not applying fertilizer in the right way. And that could be why the yields have been so disappointing. So it is a setback for the sector, but certainly the government sees cotton as the absolute mainstay. It's vitally important to Burkina Faso. And I think that country will continue to vie with Mali as the biggest producer in sub-Saharan Africa for many years to come. Ted, I'd like to kind of hone in on one uh, soft commodity right now that you think is going to be the strongest performer for the rest of the year because overall we have seen a trend where uh, across the board strong demand, general glut in supply supporting soft commodities. Of the soft commodities at the end of the year, which one would you be betting on? Uh, which, which of the kind of staples would you, would you see as outperformers? Well, I wouldn't be betting any on thing. I'm, I'm an analyst, so I don't bet on things. But certainly I would say, looking at the outlook for commodities, I would say the outlook is very strong for corn and wheat. Um, unless there's a dramatic improvement in weather in the US, we really are going to see global stocks going down and more and more people competing for less and less maize. So you definitely would have thought maize, wheat um, are very strong prices. Um, also, going later into the year, rice is unusually weak as a price, considering it's the major staple across Africa, West, East, Southern Africa. So I would expect those prices to strengthen as well going forward, especially as we're seeing some talk in Thailand and in India maybe of reducing um, rice exports. But the fact is, it's so unclear what's going to happen because we have seen over the last few years that governments respond sometimes quite dramatically when there are fears that prices have gone too high feeding into food prices. And so we're already seeing, for example, in Malawi at the moment, there's an export ban on maize, even though the country has traditionally produced a surplus. So all of these factors play in. And if you take a country like India, which is so huge, huge to the global rice and sugar market. If they suddenly decide to stop exports, we could see a massive increase in prices. As you say, very uh, political subject when it comes to soft commodities. We're also seeing that in Zambia right now, doubling their strategic maize resources. But Ted, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to have you on the show and get some insight into what's driving commodity prices. Uh, Ted George, soft commodities specialist at Ecobank today, joining us.